Welcome to the Thelma Podcast Life Story Channel. In this episode, we welcome back Andrew Grant into the studio. Andrew has been with us twice before on our Leith Lives channel, talking about Leith and World War I. Here he tells us of the journey he undertook with his wife on the Camino de Santiago pilgrimage route, a walk of around 500 miles or 780 kilometres. It starts in France and ends in Spain. We learn of the trials and tribulations of a long-distance walk, the characters he meets along the way, the ever-changing landscape, the food and wine of the various different regions of Spain and France. We hear of the camaraderie of fellow pilgrims and walkers. The Camino de Santiago is one of the great long-distance walks in Europe, and if you feel inspired to try it, Andrew gives some top tips on how to plan and prepare for the journey. We hope you enjoy. Welcome to Thelma Podcast, and it's delighted to have for a... This is the third visit, isn't it, Andrew? Yes, third visit. Third visit. We've got Andrew Grant. We're not doing Leith and First World War this time, are we, Andrew? It's something no, no. completely different, as they say. Yeah, just a wee donder over Europe. Yes, well, I'd say uh, more than a slightly, a long wee donder. But I'll pass you over and you tell us all about what you're here for today. Well, basically, this is our journey from in France to across Spain along the Camino de Santiago. Many years ago when we did it, it was unknown to us, we'll put it that way. So, but I've done a lot of research on it. But basically, if you think of pilgrimages, um, there's pilgrimages, pilgrimages are common to all religions. For instance, the Muslims go to Mecca, uh, with the Hindu to Barnabas, the Sikhs to the source of the Ganges, Christians obviously to Jerusalem, and here in Scotland, St Andrews was a source for them. And we've all heard, no doubt, about the Chaucer's tales going yes. to Canterbury. Yeah, we've yeah. all heard of that sort yeah. of bit. But anyway, I better explain about the Santiago, why that came into being. It's rather unique, Santiago. Santiago, the pilgrimage to that, because it's a journey, not actually the arrival, is the main part right. of the pilgrimage. Now, the origins are some of it is true, some of it is complete fiction. Uh, you can iron it out yourself and I'll go through it. First of all, St. James is one of Christ's disciples, and apparently he went to Spain to try and convert the Spanish people at the time. Apparently not very successful, so he returned to the Holy Land where he was. Uh, killed by Herod, he was beheaded. Now the myth is, he and his followers took his body, put it in a stone boat, <laughs> and for seven days sailed across the Mediterranean up the, the Portuguese coast and arrived at a little place called Padron, and there tried to get ashore. Now you can imagine that, a stone boat, seven days. Yeah. <laughs> took me longer than that when I was at sea. But anyway, that's an aside. But anyway, they, he died, uh, as I said, because he was beheaded and two of his followers died. And after, a, I won't go into all the detail, but after a while he was actually buried in northwest Spain. And that was it. Jump on 750 years. <laughs> so, right? Yes, a few Just years. a wee while. 750 years and a shepherd saw this bright star in the sky. We've heard this before. Right? And it shone over a cave. And he went to the cave and found three skeletons in it. So the local bishop of area Flavia turned around and said, oh, these are the bones of St James and his followers. And it became a bit of a holy site. So they built a little church over the top of it. The king, Alfonso, the king of Asturias at that time, visited the site, declared that St James was the patron saint of Spain, which he still is, built a small church and a monastery there, and a town gradually grew up round about this little cave. Eventually, the small church became a bigger church, and now it's a huge cathedral when mm. you go there. Now, the news spread about this place, and it became a source of a pilgrimage, and this is back in the medieval period. Jerusalem had been closed for a while because it was seized by the Turks in 1028, so that was no longer a source of pilgrimages. The Rome was still open, but there was also uh, political, if you want, and financial reasons for it being declared a uh, it site. usually is, isn't yes. it? Yes. The Moors were actually moving up through Spain. You know, they built some beautiful houses and uh, places down in the south of Spain. But in the northern part, they thought, if they say this is pilgrimage, people keep coming, it will keep them back. 
So that was a wee bit there. Plus, the Bishop of Cluny, who's in France, decided it was a great place from Cluny over, which is quite a long walk, for the people to go. And the, obviously, financial reasons, a very poor area, so this brought quite a bit of money into of the area from the pilgrims. It still does. And at the present moment, under the coronavirus, I don't know how a lot of the places are surviving, yeah. but people are still walking. Anyway, the Knights Templar and the Knights of St. John built refuges along the way so people could stay in these, and also churches and hospitals so that people could be looked after. So that was basically the background to it. And the great ages of pilgrimages along that area, and we tend to think we travel a lot now, but it was in the 12th to the 15th century, and they reckon over 2 million people visited Santiago in that time. Now, if you go back to the can- tales of Canterbury, yes. right, the wife of Bath, who was a bit of a raunchy character, <laughs> She was a worthy woman, and she had thrice been to Jerusalem. She had passed many a strange stream. At Rome she had been, and at Boulogne, and in Galice, at St. James, and Cologne. Now that's in Chaucer. Right, so that's there. Now, Amory Pico, who was a priest in the area, wrote the first guidebook ever, and it was the guide how to get to Santiago Good Compostela. Grief. And that book still exists, the original. It's in the museum in uh, Santiago. And I've seen pictures of it. So, it's, so uh, what sort of time would that be? When that you was about there? the 12th century, Good 13th grief. century. So he wrote that and it was all printed off. Pilgrims at those times, it was quite uh, difficult to go. Was, um, sometimes they, they were beset with wild beasts. Other times they were robbed. Sometimes they were killed. And it was really very difficult for people. And some of the bandits along the way were quite unique. They would drill them across the river and draw them and drown them halfway across so they'd get anything that the pilgrims had. And in one case, there's a bridge that still exists where they built the bridge now, but they had to cross this river and they poisoned the river so all the horses that they had and the pilgrims died and got the... I mean, that's just stories from yes, the, yeah, the yeah, yeah. Anyway, traditional pilgrims were dressed very similarly. They had a, a brown cloak because right. they could sleep in it or walk in it or whatever. They had a hat, which is very familiar to, uh, if anybody sees this, the pictures of the pilgrims. A scrip, which is a belt round, a gourd for water, right. and whatever it is, and if they were lucky, they had some money with them too. <laughs> but also in the medieval period, the courts in various countries said to the baddies, well, you'll only get forgiveness if you walk to Santiago. So I've got, right. rid- so got rid of them, right. but there was a penance to go to <laughs> Santiago. So that went on. But people had to show that they had walked away and whatever. Anyway, the pilgrimage developed and eventually it went into decline, and particularly during the Franco's area, uh, right. uh, there was very few people walked along the route, though it has now grown yeah. tremendously again. Everyone that goes along, the, as I said at the beginning, it's the route, that, uh, the walk to the route uh, that you take, that is what counts, not actually getting to the cathedral, yeah. which is important anyway. And to do that, you have a pilgrim passport. So every night, whenever you, let's say, the night or wherever, go into a pub or a hotel, they'd stamp it. So you had evidence right. that you walked it. Now, you're allowed to walk it or cycle it nowadays or right. on horseback. Right. But no motorised transport, right. whatever. So if you go there on a the bus to it, you won't get a pilgrimage oh, certificate for it. So anyway, following the Reformation, it dried up. But there are various things. In St. Jim's Day, they call them holy years. In 2004, which is a holy year, I've got the figures. 185,000 visited Santiago in that year alone. God. So the main starting points for the pilgrimages developed during the medieval period were Paris, uh, Vesely, which is in the south of Paris, uh, Le Puyon Valley, and Arles in the south. Routes from all over Europe converted on these four areas, and that was the route that you took across France and then across the Camino de Saint-Jacques in Spain, right. which was right across northern Spain. So that was the history behind it. It's much more than what I've been talking about. It's very interesting to read about it. 
And is it uh, in, in those days you were saying, and some money was a, a, an optional extra, so oh, you oh, yeah. c- you could have you could have done the whole length without any money whatsoever. Well, I think even today there's some people do it because uh, right? uh, the local people are great. They will come out and give you something, or the, even if you stay in the refuges that, that are there just now. There's no, well, most of them don't have a, a price on it. You put in yeah. what you pay, what you want. Right. Okay. And there's usually food and things like that. So during that period, people were actually reasonably well looked after. And right. then, of course, the Knights of St. John and the, them, they looked after in the hospitals and whatever. So, Do you want to tell us why? Why did you decide to do it? Uh, condense the story, too. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, we just retired, my wife and I, and we were... Well, we just completed all the Monroes just a wee while ago in Scotland. There's quite a lot of walking and things like that. And I, st- I started taking French lessons with a friend, John, and we went there every week, learned French, and improved their French because it was all conversation. And we exchanged books. And a lady came in with some French books one day, and they said, oh, if you want copies of these, and I took one for South West France, and for particular reasons for that. And when I got home, I read about this Route Saint-Jacques, it went across France. I sort of said to him, well, do you know anything about that? He said, I've heard about it. I said, oh, that's all right. So we got talking, and it came up and said, we should try it. We should go see how we got on. So that was in about, say, a November of one year. And so I started reading, started reading about it, got books like Paul Coelho, book which is called The Pilgrimage right. and Shirley McKinney the actri- actress, she's written three books about going is along she? with it. Yeah. Oh, she's right. a very, very prolific writer, she, she does a lot of stuff. But anyway, she did that and then we got started getting more and more interested and then we f- got books and maps and then eventually I thought we'll go for guidebooks right. and the <laughs> French side of it is the GR, the Grand Randonnée 65, France of crisscross with these long distance walks and there were books for going across Spain. But one of the better ones was Alison Raju, who is an, well, she wrote the guidebook for the whole route that we were taking, and that we found that excellent. Oh, right. So we had started building up the background right, information. Yeah. And then we found out about the confraternity of St James, which is in London, Blackfriars Street, and they had loads of information, because it's oh. a group from before, and they sent us out. And then once a year they travel around the country, the groups of them, including people who have gone the pilgrimage, and those want to go and they have meetings uh, that are right. set up so they have them here in Scotland. I was supposed to speak at this year's one which has been knocked on the head in Edinburgh. So anyway that started and then one night that dreech, what I would call <laughs> a foggy night in uh, Edinburgh we get yeah. periodically I was down in New Haven Harbour and paddling along the quayside to find two scallop shells because <laughs> the scallop shell is a badge that you use to oh. get through now, there's a lot of mythology and things why scallop shells yeah. are connected. I think the most practical thing is because it's handy, you can scoop water out of tap, you know, and drink it from the scallop shell or get food and put it in that. Yeah. So I'm not sure why the scallop shell became it. But anyway, I got them down in New Haven and right. that was it. And then we decided we'd set off that spring. And uh, when you think of that, again, go back to Chaucer, it said, when the sweet showers of April have pierced the drought of March and pierced it to the root. Then people long to go on pilgrimages and the blessed master are there to seek. So that was us, the wow. spring. So anyway, we decided what we'd do, we'd fly out to Le puy en Valley in yeah. uh, eastern France and then start the, that's one of the, the assembly points, and then travel across France and we'd do that in one stage, right. and that was from the spring. Then we decided we wouldn't go across Spain in the summer because it'd be stinking hot. So we'd go back in uh, September. Right. In fact, just tomorrow's date's the date we started. Oh. I'm back going. And we'd do the Spanish side in September. So that's what we did. And that's how we got involved. And what year was that? 2003. Right, OK. But we've been back to do the Portuguese one after that, but I'll explain that later. <laughs> right. So anyway, that's basically how we got it. And we started in Mapuli, and an auspicious day it happened to be Easter Sunday. Oh, so good timing. We set off in pouring rain. <laughs> We'd had to meet uh, two of our friends, John and Barbara, had a house in Spain. They came up and spent a few days with us from the, uh, a house in France, sorry. Right. And they came up and spent a few days with us in Le Puy and saw us off at the beginning. So from Le Puy to start, you have to go up a steep hill, right. which has happened a lot. And at the top of the hill, you go onto the path, 
and that's you right out yeah. Santiago, right. 1,700 kilometres that way. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, John and Barbara sat there and they counted 80 pilgrims setting off that day, but we never we saw only two or three at any one time. Yes. Incredible. So... Well, let's ha let's have our first bit of music, shall yeah. we? And appropriately, there is music to do with walking, not necessarily pilgrimage. This is uh, round the bend of the road. Well, there were many bends. <laughs> oh, well, I'm sure there was over seventeen hundred kilometres. We just got you pulling away up that hill, yeah. but had you done lots of research on what you were going to carry, where, and? Well, we'd done a lot of walking in the past. As I mentioned earlier, we'd done the Monroes and done various other things, so we knew not what not to carry. But at the same time, it was what to carry. So we were carrying it all ourselves. There are companies that will transport your gear from one place to the next. That there, and Lots of people make use of it then. Mm. But we decided we'd carry the lot ourselves on our backs and rucksacks. Uh, so we had one complete change of clothing for each day. Well, for the day. Yeah. Clothing that we could wear in the evening and uh, warm fleece. Yeah. And also a uh, raincoat. Right. And a hat. Good boots. I was going to say the, footwear yeah. would no, be. No, footwear is actually incredible. Uh, I mean, you've got to walk all that distance, but you're just going to make sure if your feet are not comfortable, you're not comfortable. Mm. You might have to wear a sweaty jacket or whatever, but not your boots. No. But anyway, the boots we had we'd been using for quite a while, and they were most comfortable ones, and they saw us the whole way through both sections as well. Wow. Great boots. Others, we saw some people in various things like trainers and in fact in one case we saw them with flip flop they, what? Did, they didn't make it but anyway I'll come back to that later <laughs> so we had that, so we had a complete change for during the day uh, plus toilet equipment and things mm. like that, or cameras guidebooks and basically I, I carried a little notebook with me and the, the camera I had with me most just ready because uh, I wrote to, as you know this volume of material when yes. I came back, uh, in the little notebook I used to just write a word, a phrase or maybe uh, a sentence, and when it came back, it prodded the mind to oh, of course, write yeah. everything else. Yeah. But we had, we had, I think my rucksack weighed 15 kilos, and my right. wife said 10. Sorry. Right, okay. So, or 10 or 12. That varied according to the amount of food we were carrying. I was going to say. But we got that along the way as well. Yeah, yeah. So, and how yeah. Uh, did you make a decision? You obviously made a decision of where you were going to be staying. Did you book ahead? Or? Yes, but in the planning, I mean, I, I always think actually, if you ever go on holiday, I always think the research is just as much important as going there. Mm. And so we'd done a lot of research on it. And then the guidebooks that we had, I worked it out at about 25 kilometres a day walking found the most appropriate places to stay. But there was a very good book, and anyone going on the a Camino should get it. It's called Miam Miam Dodo. M-I-A-M, Miam Miam Dodo. Right. That means yum yum and snoring. Right. And the guy wrote it, and he had actually in it all sorts of accommodation at almost every place along the route. So you could choose hotel, b and &B, or whatever, or even the refugees were all in this book, and the phone numbers and other information. Right. So before I went, we went on the holiday, I said, well, I'll do the first week, I'll book up that up, which I did do the first working on and roughly 25k a day. Thereafter, when we got to about the end of that, I'd phone ahead, right. about three days ahead, and book accommodation as we right. went along. Most, Not all the time, most of the time we got it. Uh, my French was quite good, so I was able to converse quite yeah. uh, well with Which these helps. people that helped a lot when we got to Spain it didn't but I'll come back to that <laughs> <laughs> but anyway that was it and then the food we actually along the way we got into a pattern of having a, like a what I call a continental breakfast in the morning when we get up mid morning we'd have coffee and a coke surprising we right. eventually adopted that and a bite something we could pick up on the way yeah. afternoon a piece of fruit or whatever mm. and then in the evening we had f food at the restaurant or wh the bars or whatever we came across and the food along the way I'd say without a doubt was excellent every right. place we went yeah, and were you opting because there's the pilgrim's meal set meal yeah. isn't it? well the pilgrim meals are basically more uh, appropriate when you get to Spain I'm not sure and I can't swear to this but the Spanish government put a price limit on what you can charge a pilgrim. 
Very good. I'm not saying the ordinary punter, I don't know what they no. do with that, mm. but the, the pilgrim meals, and they were excellent too. I mean, I never had a, I don't think I ever had a duff, a duff meal all the way along. Right. And of course, it was accompanied by a wine all the way. Well, I've heard this, there's uh, quite a bit of wine. And, and Spain, the wine is actually included in the meal. And not the first, not the first time you finish the, they give you a flag in between the two of you, and if you finish that, they'll come and top it up again. Oh well, they, they did that in those days. I'm not sure if they do it now, <laughs> but they did then. And it was good. Wow, that yeah. is, that is so, very. But along the way, I mean, we're talking about food. We found at university there was um, one of the lecturers used to say, "France is a pays de pays, a land of land, not right. pays de pays," uh, and it was true. Especially when food was concerned, because right. we started off in Le Puy, and we got a lot of lentils there. Right. Yeah. Move over a bit further along, we came across Aligo. Right. I don't know if we'll, you had Aligo? No. It's like they mix cheese in with the potatoes, and it's like chewing them, but it tastes delicious. Oh, yes. And then further along, we came to bits where they used uh, barley and wheat instead of potatoes or whatever right. food. Up in the old breakfast, I mentioned just now, you were getting steak, you know, s- stewing steak, which was gorgeous. Eventually, down towards the western part, that you were getting into duckling, duck area, and right. pâté de foie and all that. That's so great. it was great. It was it? You had all these different yeah. gastronomic regions going across France. It was mm. great. In Spain, that tended to be not the same, but similar at yeah. each place okay. you went. Right. Right. So that was the, f- the food side of it. Yeah. So it was very good. Weather-wise... The first day, as I said, it was pouring the rain when we set off and it became quite dreech for the rest of the day. <laughs> but most of the time it was in very good weather, okay. sometimes sunny, whatever it was, but we had the clothing for it. But the one thing people in um, going in the, on these pilgrimages fr- to Santiago from uh, any of the, the starting points in France is to watch about sunburn. Oh, right, because okay. what you get is the outside of your left leg's all burnt, the inside of your right leg's mm. burnt, your left arm is all suntanned, mm. and your right hand's still, you're still white. <laughs> and it's the same with your face because you're walking in one direction Constantly, yeah. and the sun's on the left yeah, all yeah. the time. So yeah. you get that. So these are sort of things that we had there. Laundry, that because we had to, you know, we just yeah. changed. What we did every night, we came in, stripped off, had a shower, rinsed the clothes off that we had. Yeah hang them out to dry, and they were ready for the next night when we changed it. So it was like that all the way along. And we had quick line tr- drying clothing. I won't right. go to the makers, but then yeah. uh, it was very, usually dry, dried overnight. Yeah. If they didn't, the next day you'd stop for a rest, hang it up on the bushes or the trees, and it's then got dried. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Extra socks, by the way. I should have said right, that. socks yeah, are important, important as well yes, as fo- footwear. Right. Yeah. So anyway, we went across. I won't go to all the different uh, locations we went, but the the route from Le Puy en Valley is the Sauge, Espalion, Estang, Conk, Fisiac, Cahor, Moisac, Condom, Air La Dour and Navarronx. Right. These are the towns. But I mean they'll pick it, anyone that wants to do it will pick it up on the, the yes. guidebook. So we did that route. And we had lots of experiences along the way. We met oh, lots of people that we you know, there was two or three of them we started off the same day and we meet up occasionally, not all the time. Oh gosh. And when you're walking along these routes, I mentioned eighty you wouldn't see it. you know, all day you could walk and not see another soul. Is that right? Night. And then at night you'd meet up because of as you say, there's lots of bends. Yeah. You might be around that bend or the bend behind <laughs> you. But we managed that okay, and we walked across the most of the area. But one of the there was various villages we went across, like Conk and Estang, are absolutely beautiful yeah. little villages, and the churches in them are, are phenomenal. They're well worth going just to see these, actually, yeah. on the way. But when one or two bits of experiences, you climb very high, as I said, out of Le Puy, and then we go up onto the Aubrac Plateau, and that in the springtime when we crossed it was a mass of flowers, oh, absolutely wonderful. beautiful. I can read a little bit of my story from my notebook yeah. about that. Yeah, said. please do. Uh, just about that day, if you yeah. can bear with me. Yeah. Today is the day of wildflowers. This is the entry in my note, my, yeah. my wee notebook. And what wildflowers there were too. The plateau of the Aubrac and the lower slopes of the wood, and the woodland areas had an abundance of them. Of those I could recognise, I noted daffodils, violas, pansies, digitalis, gentians, orchids, primula, wood sorrel, 
to name but a few, and a lot more I didn't know. Good uh, There are several thousand different plants up on that plateau, wow. apparently. There's many more. I just marvelled at them, but didn't see them. Every day of the journey, however, we had birds, uh-huh. and there seemed to be a cuckoo amongst them all the time, <laughs> right? We began the day with a late breakfast and a variety of homemade bread and jams and large cups of coffee, and having packed the night before, we are off by 8.40. Again, this was through pastoral farmland, a bit cloudier in the day than it had been earlier. The Obrak is a beautiful area, yeah. absolutely beautiful area. Were you ever tempted to kind of linger a while, or was it a oh, case oh, every day? Oh, no, it wasn't just a case of plodding, you know, go no. get, get there. We stopped and we looked and admired and photographed mm. or whatever, wherever we went. If we got to some churches that we th- my said we'd go in and see them, the inside of them, the ones in Conk and the Esteng that I mentioned already, they were absolutely beautiful inside. In fact, on Conk, I think it was called, yeah. After we had our meal, we went down for a walk around the village. We could hear music in the church we went in here. It was a full concert, classical music and popular music. Yeah. And they just said, well, come and sit down. So we were entertained for about an hour, just okay. in that one church. It was yeah. beautiful. Others were great. I mean, some of them are astounding, that's all I'd say, about the churches along yeah. the way. I'm not sure if I've got the right term. The timpan of them over the top of the entrance with biblical carvings in them are absolutely incredible, mm. although they were done several centuries ago, mm. you know, mm. they're st- and they're still very good, they're yeah. actually good there. Yeah. So that's typical of going across that area. There was people, as I mentioned earlier, there was one or two that we knew. There was one lad that started off at the same time I asked called Eugene. He was a businessman from Paris, but he had to go back because there was a problem. There was another lady, Danielle, who was about our age too, but I don't think I'd walked much. But So she was trailing behind us as yeah. we could be advanced. But then one day we were walking into another village and this car drew up and this lady came out she said, Oh, I've got somebody that you know here. And it was this Danielle. She'd oh. actually got a leg injury. Oh, so she was taking her, her, in her car oh. because this lady who was driving, her husband was walking it and oh, she was oh. driving the car from place to place. Oh, I see. So Danielle got in. Oh, so right. we saw her a few days yeah. later. Oh, and then we met this lady called Michelle. We had a group of seven with her and she takes people every year. Oh, along I see. A very interesting person. She was a English teacher in France, she was there, and we saw her quite a lot. Yeah, and it was various things. And one other person we met, and I must compliment this guy. His name was Gerard. He came from the Netherlands, and he was walking across the area too. Seemingly a very rich person with yeah. a very good job, threw it aside and decided he needed something else in his life, so he walked out. And as he was walking, the stray dog took company with him, and the dog and he walked all the way. Good grief. But he had a, a little rucksack made for the dog, and the dog carried its food in the rucksack. And he had arranged with his friends to send dog food to meet all him right. all the way along. And they walked from the Netherlands pair of him and the dog right across France oh, and amazing. then right across Spain to the and we knew Danielle made it she sent us a postcard which arrived Michelle and I were in correspondence for a wee while until yes. she moved the house and never sent me a new address right. so anyway we went along and we there was something different every day you yeah. know you could, no day was the same maybe the <coughs> time we started walking the time we finished or whatever but we enjoyed it but on the old bracket as well we're talking about food on the old bracket up there this Danielle was there and we were just walking through. It's a very small village, mm. lovely cathedral, a couple of hotels and things there. It was on the pilgrim route. And she stopped and said, oh, did you like the tart? And I said, what do you mean you liked it? Oh, you must have the tart. You don't get the tart. Go back to the, this hotel to get the tart. Yeah. So we thought, oh, well, we better stick yeah. on. So we actually turned around, went back into this restaurant place and all the French people were down and said, Sally, go say it, go say it, it's a Scotsman. <laughs> and coming in, and they had this huge tarp, but quite about all bits, I'd say at least 15 inches in diameter. Wow. And you got slices of the cut it into eight pieces, and it was all fruits made from the Obrak plateau all over it. And they served up tea, which was made from herbs in the Obrak area too. So we were very glad to be stopped that day. These are experiences you meet up along the way. Yeah. 
Yes. And various other things happen, you know. You can't talk about everything every day. No, you know? no, 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 no. Uh, along the way, too, people, well, the local people were very good towards us. Some came out and gave you things and water if you wanted it. And along the way, there was places where they had laid, every day they put bottles of water out, you could just take it if you want. And that was the local people. Good grief. Knowing that water was so yes, uh, yes, a precious course. commodity as you went along. So anyway, we walked right across France. That was a mere 900 kilometres. <laughs> uh, how many weeks did that take? Or how many uh, days? It was five weeks the first right. time we went off. And we ended at a place called Navarance, which is a fortified town, huge walls, thick wall, and stayed in a hotel there. Mm. And from there we actually got down to Po. And from Po, we flew home for the summer. We didn't want to walk over at the northern France in the summer because it's get, it gets really, really yeah, hot. Yeah, yeah. So that was the end of stage one was Navarrox. Well, that's a good place to have another record. I'd like to put this one in now because it does drive everyone mad. It's the Oberkirchen Children's Choir and it's the... Let me read this from the label. It's actually... De Frolich Wanderer, or as you will know and be humming it for the rest of the day, the Happy Wanderer. <laughs> There we go. The uh, what do they call it? An earworm. I think they call it when a tune gets in your head. That oh. is the Oberkirchen Children's Choir. Right. We got to the end of France, didn't we, Andrew? Well, start where we left off in Navarrex. Yes. Flew back out again in September, September the fourth, I think it was the exact right. date, to go across Spain, and flew out to Po and then back to Navarrex. Same hotel, same right. room. Right. And then the next morning we set off to go away across rather but finished France and then into Spain. Mm. Uh, it was three days from Navarrex to Saint Jean and Pied de Port. It takes about three days. And at Saint Jean, that's where a lot of people start their pilgrimage. A tough place to start because the first walk's right up over the Pyrenees, and the number of people that don't make it is oh, not man. unusual. Mm. So anyway, we got down to Saint Jean. Stayed the night there and went off up over the Pyrenees. And in this case, we were actually passing people a lot as we went along because we were quite fit, both my wife and yeah. I. And people who had just started, they were labouring up this oh, steep course. hill to go over the hill. And on the top, you, um, which is halfway between where we started in Le Puyon Valley and Navarrong and uh, Santiago, is a statue of a Madonna that had been brought up from Lourdes by the shepherds. And they got there halfway and had a obligatory photograph taken yes. at it. And that's just before you cross into Spain, right. where the border happens to be a cattle grid. <laughs> so you walk over the cattle grid, and I've got a photograph of my wife in, um, in Spain and me in yeah. France, and then off we went down the other side. And when we were on the way down, our heavens opened the most torrential oh. rain and we got down to Roncesvalles, which again is another start point. It's a yeah. monastery where lots of more people were actually on the pilgrimage at this time. But along the way, we decided we weren't going to sleep in the refugios or albergues that go up now. And I've heard stories about them, about the people snoring at night and everything keeping you ever awake. We wanted their comfort. So these, <laughs> so in effect, are hostel. host Their hostels right. are, uh, a lot of them are manned by people like the Confraternity of St James in other countries as well, and yeah. all by volunteers, all done with that, in the majority of cases. Mm. So they are right across Spain, everywhere, almost everywhere has it. So we spent basically there, but we'd meet up with the people in the bars at night or wherever yeah. for meals and whatever, and we'd chat with that. But then we crossed our way through Pamplona and then to Bur Burgos, Leon, and then over into Santiago. We tend to avoid cities. In France, it was lots of small towns or villages, and the majority of that is in Spain. It's for the ones I've just, just talked about just now. But when Michel, the girl that was, uh, we met in France, told us, when you come to the Mesita, get the bus from Burgos to Leon, don't walk across the Mesita. OK. And I thought, oh, well, what's this Mesita like? You know, yeah. I know what it is, but what's it like? But anyway, eventually I arrived on the Mesita, Masita, from we got you come up on one side of a hill and you look before you and all you see is this huge plain away ahead of you, going off, on for miles and miles and miles and miles. But it was autumn, 
Right. In this plain, they grow g- grain in it or sunflowers, and uh, they're all gone. So all that was left was the golden stubble on the field. It's one of the best areas that we've actually had to walk. And I c- if I can read you again, yes, please uh, do a small extract yes. from my thing here. I say, the vastness of the plain amazed me. The province of Castile Leon is not only the largest in Spain, but also at ninety four thousand square kilometers. It's the largest in Europe. Extent is a bit larger than Portugal and three times the size of Holland. So that's what we're going on. God. So then I went on and say, again, we were back in intense silence as we walked on. Molly walked ahead of me. As I walked along, a feeling of utter, total contentment overcame me. It was a feeling of relaxation, peace and tranquility that I have never experienced before. As I walked along, the crunch of my boots on the gravel, the bird song, the wind through the stubble, and the slip slap slop of my water bottle, I've never felt so the intrusions of the sands. It was a sands that were even in the Scottish mountains or the Himalayas I had never encountered. The thought came into my head that this is my church. The feeling of being lasted for quite a lot, about 90 minutes. And there's a feeling it's difficult to describe unless you experience it. That's amazing. And that was going across this quite flat wow. area, which we were told to avoid. Isn't that amazing? Uh, it just shows told, you that people's experiences but, are different. Uh, different, yeah. yeah. And going across it, because it just went on and on and on, you knew what, and some of the roads were almost dead straight. There was no shade, no. absolutely none whatsoever. You went along. And, of course, with the sun beating down, nowhere to even shade to get a a drink of water. But periodically there were fountains, so we could top up with water. Oh, right. But at one point we came across a man lying in the gutter and a girl beside him. He was actually a pilgrim who had been overcome by the heat. and His friends had walked off and left him. So the girl had spoke fluent Spanish, which I didn't, yeah. and they managed to get a car to take him down to the next town. We got him out of the ditch and got him on. But anyway, that was the sort of thing that could happen to you if you're not it's careful. a bit much that the rest of them Well, they went on. on. I, don't think, I don't know what. But anyway, he gave up the, doing the rest of the Camino after that, so it was quite bad. We got down, as I say, it was Bur- Burgos, where we start, and Leon. These are great big cathedrals and very well worth visiting, going mm. around. And we went into them for a wee while as we passed through the towns. We decided to stay in the villages or smaller towns. So we did that. But as I mentioned about this guy, it fell in the thing, and I couldn't speak Spanish. Mm. What I did before we went to Spain is I decided... I couldn't speak a word of Spanish except vino tinto, you know, I knew what that was. But other than that, uh, no Spanish. So I wrote a lot of little questions or phrases that I might be asked, that I could ask them. So when I was phoning up the hotels or whatever to get a booking, I would say to them, you know, I am Scottish, I don't Mm. speak Spanish, which I had my little slip. slip. Do you have a night for a booking for this night? That went well all the way along, except at one place, which was a a truck driver's stop that was staying in that night. I started this phrasing, and this girl said, excuse me, sir, I think we should speak in English. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so that, was, that deflated me. <laughs> and periodically, it was not once or tw- mm. twice that it happened, but I gave the name and whatever it was and bo- bo- booked the thing. And mm. when we arrived, they said, no, we don't have a booking for you. I said, yeah, oh, no. book him. And they said, yeah, I said, Mr. Grant. Blah, blah. And they said, no, 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 no. I said, I said, we were Scottish. And they'd like this one. Oh, it's Scots, <laughs> these Scots people. And they'd roar and laugh. But anyway, yeah. that was the same. There yeah. was various things like that as we went along. But as we went along as well, one of the things we were struck with was the number of memorials that we've came across. Mm. There was one on almost on the summit of the Pyrenees where the winter before a um, Brazilian who had been told not to go from saint Jean over the Pyrenees had succumbed to hypothermia and he died and they found his body leaning up against a tree and they put a memorial there for him at that right. particular tree. Further on, we came across another one where a Canadian lady had stopped for our lunch or a break or whatever it was, sitting at the side of the road, and a car swerved off the road right into her, killed her, mm. and got a, a memorial to her. A cyclist at another point, and they've made a bicycle out of wire 
which is on top of this plaque where he actually was killed. That was unfortunate. And then I think the most, well, well they were all, when you saw that, it, it took your mind off the road a wee bit. But the day before you arrive in Santiago, there's one set in a wall and a pair of boots in it. And these belonged to a man who died of a heart attack at that point, mm. the day before he arrived in oh. Santiago. And there was lots of others along the way, but these are just four examples yes. to show that even in the medieval period when people were dying along the way, yeah. people still die en route yeah. to Santiago yeah. from various sources now, but not as many. No, no, thank goodness. Well, and there's no, no banditry, obviously. <laughs> no band. Uh, well, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there is. We'll have another musical break, and this is Sam Bronson with Roman, which is roaming, I should say, is a Bud Flanagan song. The lovely roaming with Sam Bronson. Andrew, back to you. Back another few strides, hello. <laughs> anyway, near the end of the pilgrimage, you go into Galicia, which is a very, very interesting country yeah. uh, area. It's mountainous and very good, but Santiago's in the middle of that uh, right. Galicia. And one of the things the Galician authorities have done is all the way along you get markers that are like little plinths that are up there with the exact distance to Santiago on it. Could be 193 kilometres, 274 metres. Oh, really? Had, exactly. It was so precise, the whole lot, and they were accurate. That was the thing. Oh. But the unfortunate thing is, some they have actually got scallop shells set into them. You know, not real ones. And vandals have come along, try to prize these off. So it's the one bit of vandalism we saw along the way. Right. But anyway, we go out into the Galician Mountains and the very ancient villages there, some of them really old farming villages and the only thing that keeps them going is actually pilgrims coming through and buying stuff in the, the shop or uh, occasionally putting them up in B&Bs and things yeah. like that along the way. So we've got that. So it took us a few days to get through Galicia. There is one of these pillars which is painted yellow and that's 100 kilometres to go. And one of the rules of the Camino is that if you're walking, you have to walk at least 100 kilometres and you can cycle, but you must cycle by 200 kilometres. So there is that. Uh, and we met uh, quite a few cyclists along the way. Four of them came from Denmark and cycled all the way from Denmark. Two of them were going back after Santiago. Other two were cycling down to Porto, then over to Yugoslavia, as it was then, or Croatia, and then cycling back up to Denmark. Uh, and one of them actually said he came, comes over to Sky every year for a week. So a very good plan. Yes. So they were, when we were walking along, you talk about songs saying, they were down the road which was below where we were walking, and he came along saying, you'll take the high road, we'll take the high road. <laughs> well, You'd have quite, to. quite appropriate. Yes. But anyway, in Galicia, you get to a place called Monte de Gozo, which is uh, almost the end of the pilgrimage, and there's various statues there. One was erected when the Pope at the time actually went there and they did one to commemorate his visit. And there is uh, another one with two pilgrims in traditional garb pointing because it's the first time you see the cathedral. <sighs> But it takes you about a day to walk from there to the cathedral really? and you get down. And I mentioned at the beginning there about our two friends that stay in France that saw us off and Le Puy yeah. actually decided to come and meet us and we arrived in Santiago, which was wow. great. I said I planned a lot and all the way along. And I said to them before we set off, I said, the, on the second one, I said, we'll be in Santiago on the 5th of October at half past ten at the church, the cathedral. So we arrived Such at, confidence. Oh, well, yeah, that's the issue of how planning works. I arrived at 25 past ten. <laughs> so I said I was sorry I was, uh, sorry I was early. <laughs> but anyway, we did that. That was very good. Mm. But then you get to the, when you get to Santiago, there's a, a routine you go through, you go and get your certificate because you've got that along the way. And then you go, the church has a pilgrim service every day. You can go in there and there's usually at, at that service they say what countries people have come from. 
Mm. And sometimes it's quite long, uh, other times it's quite short. Never mm. mentioned Scotland, which annoyed me, but anyway, that's an aside. <laughs> yes. uh, he, said, he said Britain, so I let him off. Ah. Uh, but uh, on the way, I mean, for instance, we, we, we met over people from over 80 different countries Gosh. and on the way. Some we couldn't speak their language, no, but no. we could converse. It was amazing yeah. how you get on talking to people yeah. without actually speaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So it's there. And then there is a, a tradition that you go through, you go into the cathedral, there's a pillar where everybody has put their hands and all the finger marks are still there. It's okay. the little holes. Uh, you go round the back of the altar where there's a statue of St James and everybody gives that statue a hug. And you come down from there, go down to the crypt and there's a gold casket, which were the, supposedly the remains of St James there. Mm. People have that, so you go that. And this, at the service as well, if you're lucky, there's usually about oh, eight or ten people there. Uh, eight or ten priests, I should say, on the altar doing it. And while we were there, there was a nun who, I assume she was a nun, but she was dressed in nun's clothing, was singing. Beautiful uh -huh. falsetto voice, absolutely tremendous. But when we were sitting in the church, we could see she went round behind the altar and put on her makeup, <laughs> put her lips to it, then came back for the next song. <laughs> anyway, one thing I didn't mention when we came through Osobrero in one of the places, uh, in uh, Galicia, yeah. we, we stayed at Osobrero. And also Sobrero, they actually uh, had Galician pipers and it was a crowded pub, it was a porn oh. marine outside, and they started playing Galician, Galician music on the pipes. So it was great for us yeah, Celtic absolutely, people. Yeah. Really good. And it's well worth listening to some of them, their music. But anyway, we went to the service with John Barbara and uh, decided we'd have a celebratory dinner, which we hmm. did. And it just happened to be my wife's 66th birthday oh. as well. So it was a double celebration. Yeah. And we stayed on there for a while, went back along the Camino in John's car, and uh, Barbara's car, uh, went to various places, and they dropped us at Bilbao, and right. we flew back home to Edinburgh. Wow. That was just 1,700 kilometres of just. a stroll. Just a wee, a wee don. So what about, are you going to come to the uh, girl from Greg's? Oh, yes, I never thought I'm, about it. Yeah, yeah but I that's an important... this girl from Dave. Oh, yeah, the second day when we got to Santiago to Compostela, our maps were a wee bit tatty after, you know, the, yeah. the weeks. Uh, I'm not surprised. I thought, I'd like to get another map. So I, th I said to Molly, I'm going out to get a map. I left her in the hotel and went down stairs, asked the concierge if we'd get a so I go to the bookshop, it's blah, 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 and I thought, oh, I'll find my way. Yeah. And we got down there and I was trying to find this, stand like a tourist, <laughs> didn't know where to go. And this young lady come up to me and she said, can I help you? You know, she obviously knew. I said, I'm looking for a bookshop where I get a map. And she spoke very good English and I said, no, that's good. She said, I'm actually going past one, I'll take you. Take you. So we strolled along the road and I told her we're pilgrim. We had a good time. And she said, Where are you from? I said, Scotland. She says, Oh, that's interesting. She says, I've just come from Scotland. I said, Oh, that's fine. What are you doing there? She says, I'm at university studying languages and I've come home because it's my 21st birthday. I said, oh, congratulations. That was it. I'm here in Scotland. Aren't you? She said, oh, in Edinburgh. And I said, Edinburgh? Yeah. She said, I've got a job there. I work in Greggs and Elm Row. And I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> it was one of these, I mean, yeah. it couldn't have happened there. And uh, when I came back, I went up to see her, and there she was in Greggs and How Elm bizarre. Row. What, what, what a what, small what, world, yeah, isn't it? I mean, just the fact, looking for a map. So I got my map yeah. anyway and back. So anyway, that's a very, very small description of, uh, I mean, I wrote this, I wrote when I came back to call my notes yeah. and decided I was going to write this out. So I've written what's 130 odd pages of, of a, 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 a thing with about 300 photographs that I've took. So it helps me to remember. And yeah. even just the last few days went reading through things I'd forgotten. You know, it's amazing, I mean, it's important to write it oh down, yeah. obviously. So I was going to ask you before you're going to read us out with a poem, before we do that, just Thanks once again, Andrew, because it's it's always always interesting to have you in the studio. Yeah. But I was going to ask you. Obviously, you were pretty fit before you started. Oh, yes. mm -hmm. Would you say that is it the sort of thing that you can you can do gently and and get fit as you're doing it? Well, I always prefer being fit before I start off anything like yeah. that. But uh, but there are people that just say like at Saint Jean. 
who had never walked any more than 25 miles of, mm-hmm. and started off on the Pyrenees. Uh, there was others who was get, had not done a lot of what I call training no. going along and a lot of them excuse the word fell by the wayside mm-hmm. that was, but not, not a lot I mean one, we met one or two and mm. a lot of them wearing the wrong type of boots or shoes yeah. and I ran out of blister patches patching oh. people up along the way right uh, it was really because I always take a pile of them with me mm. I'd say best to get fit beforehand yeah but before we went a few months before we went we actually started doing Longer and longer walks, right. but also not just doing a walk like say today, and then another one next week. We decided we'd do one for two, right. three days in succession, because right. that's what often beats people. Yeah, you know they can do twenty kilometres, no <laughs> other. Yeah, but to do twenty today, tomorrow, yeah. and the next day. So we we actually did quite a lot of practice for before we went. Yeah. Yeah. And would you say, I mean, very obviously it's a pilgrim, yes. pilgrim route. Would you say you have to be religious to do it? No, not necessary. I think there's people there. I think the people go because it's a, a route, you know, mm. and, a, and a nice scenic route to go on, just saying that. But it is a pilgrim route, and we did go into churches quite a lot yeah. uh, and, and to services, actually, so we went along the way. I think there's a certain amount of religious spirit within everybody of some type or another they ask you at the end what the real purpose of the journey was right. none of them say is it religious or secular or whatever yeah. and they keep a, a tab on that I think a lot of people are genuinely religiously orientated that go on that yes. but not all no not all no. No, you're quite right well I think it's highly suitable that you're going to put, uh, take us out with a, a very spiritual, I would say, poem. Uh, the poem. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's called The Camino, and it's one that a pilgrim wrote the same time as we were walking the Camino. I didn't know that till I got a copy Good of his Lord, poem. Right, right. But anyway, it's quite evocative in a way. Yeah. It, said, it said, when we started, we didn't know exactly why we were doing it. We had lives that were more or less satisfactory. We'd friends, known much of our life. We'd children, changed from chrysalis into butterflies. We'd things, things like cars, things like washing machines, things like power drills, things like music, things like pictures, things like shelves full of books, things like money, pensions or security. We didn't have one thing, and that is maybe why we started. When we started, we put one foot in front of the other, we still did not know precisely why we were doing it. The miles passed, many of them pleasantly. Our feet blistered and were slow to heal. Our anchors turned on loose stones. The rain beat its way through our clothes. The cold chilled the marrow to our bones. Some nights the refuge was hard to find. Some days hot dust had no fountains. When we first had a few many long days had passed, we found without words that we no longer walked together, that together we spoke in our own tongues and often of things that we left behind but were gone, that together we shut off this new experience with the wall of our togetherness, that alone we spoke in the tongues and of our common experience, that alone we were open, open with interest and curiosity. Often we met with gladness at the end of the day to know our paths went on together was enough. When we got to the cathedral, we sat down. We saw, through the eyes of those long before us, the blinding faith, the crucial thirst for salvation, the tower slowly closing off the sky, and we counted our blessings, several hundred of them, starting with the kindness of ordinary people along the way and the warmth of other travellers on the road. Travellers not at all like us, not in age, not in origin, not in interest, but warm across these distancing and ending with friendship and love we had left behind where we had begun. When we got to the sea at the end of the world, we sat down on the beach at sunset. We knew why we'd done it, to know our lives were less important than just one grain of sand, to know that we did not need these things we'd left behind, to know that we'd nevertheless returned to them, to know that we needed to be where we belonged, to know that kindness and friendship and love is all one needs, to know that we did not, after all this making the journey long, to find that out, to know for us, but it certainly helped. Excellent. That's lovely. Uh It puts it in context. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And sums it up for you. Yes, it does. 
Thank you very much again, Andrew, and I hope that you will return to, for another subject at some point. But we uh, will certainly get back. Thanks again. Thank you for listening to this episode of Life Story. Thelma Podcast also have other channels that showcase memories and stories we have collected over the years. The Thelma Tapes, short podcasts built around a theme such as pets from the past, sweeties, car memories, sporting heroes and hogmanay. There is also Leith Lives, growing up, living and working in Leith. There's also music, forgotten songs from the broom cupboard, obscure and forgotten music and songs played from old 78 RPM records. Analog Rory's Tuesday Blues, a trawl through lesser-known blues music from an extensive vinyl record collection. Links to all these channels can be found on our website, www.livingmemory.org.uk, or are available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Deezer and Google Play Music. We also have our Wee Museum of Memory at Ocean Terminal Shopping Centre, Level 2, next to Britannia, and we are open 10.30 until 4pm, seven days a week. Why not come in and have a look round our huge collection and share some memories? You might end up in our recording studio and actually on one of these podcasts. Thanks again.